William, my dear brother-in-law. So, this is the commerce ready to take us to England. It's almost time to set sail. A new voyage, a new opportunity. I know this kind of journey is familiar to you, but this is a new adventure for me. This, this is my home. Doc Ward, the noise of the wharfs. The mingling of different accents and languages. Irish, German, West Indian, West African, British. I've spent years watching the arrival and departures of ships filled with traded goods like this one. Men loading cargo, rope makers at work. I was in awe of the ship's carpenters, shaping the wood and repairing damage from each ship's most recent voyage. I especially loved watching the sailors hoist the sails that my father made. You know how much we all talk about my father, Thomas. My father taught me to read. We would practice reading scripture or father would teach me the words of the hymns that we sang on Sundays. As a boy, I followed him to Robert Bridges sail loft where he worked alongside white and black men the only free African there. My father, my father was meticulous in his work. He gave close and careful attention to every sail he crafted. I would sit close to him, watching as he laid out the canvas across the floor and cut out the shapes of the sails. The sails, the sails were so big, they had to be hoisted through the window. I had to stay clear of the way so not to get knocked down by their size and weight. When I got older, my father began teaching me sail making. I'd help out around the loft by sweeping the floor or picking over scrap canvas to preserve the usable pieces. I'd prepare beeswax for sewing thread, its sweet, honeyish smell at my fingertips. My father, my father gave me this sail making fid. It was his, I, I learned how to use it. Stretching the canvas for grommets. I even learned how to sew a few canvas pieces myself. And by the end of the day, my hands were stiff and feet ached from all the work. My devout Anglican father reminded me that God would indeed bless us if we followed the work of the Lord and not of men. Eventually, he ventured on his own, making a few sales here and there. I was proud to be following in his footsteps. I imagined that would be my work someday, until he died when I was seven years old. After my father's death, my mother, Margaret, felt that receiving an education was the next important step. She sought the help of Anthony Benazet. I still admire her for that, asking a white Quaker teacher to take me as a student. It probably helped that Benize was always ready to point out the contradiction between slavery and the Christian doctrine. He knew that we could achieve the same things as white people. I think, I think most of society sees us as inherently flawed lazy, a burden, at least when we're not making a profit for them. But some people, like Robert Bridges and Anthony Benize, see us for who we are, a people with a rich culture and history. Uh, but then again, Robert Bridges is a slaveholder himself. That's the corruption, slavery. My mother and sister, your dear Abigail, provided for the household and my education, but were barely making ends meet. I was only at school for two years before I had to stop to find work. I had heard of other free African children being forced 
into indentured servitude if they or their parents were found to be a burden on society. Boys, younger than me being forced to work until they were 24 years old. But how? How would that help them and their families? I did whatever I could to support my family. I picked up odd jobs here and there, running up and down Dock Ward. Sweeping floors and stocking shelves. I worked at Benazay's grocery store, and sometimes I ran errands for Bridges. Now, I might have stopped school, but I did not stop learning. I read my Bible, the newspaper, and the pamphlets I would come across in the street. News of the rebellion was everywhere. Frightening and exciting at the same time. Delegates held meetings. People here in the city boycotted British goods. And then, reports from New England about Lexington and Concord, Bunker Hill. The revolution had begun. But what did this rebellion mean for Africans? The enslaved Africans at the sail loft did much of the same work as the white journeymen, but their only hope and aspiration was that one day they would be free. Maybe, maybe it's a cycle. First, you work your life away trying to earn your freedom like my grandfather. Then once you get it, you work your life away trying to keep it. I read a pamphlet by Thomas Paine. Thomas, like my father's name. He was the one who showed us the error of our ways. How could Americans say they were slave to British tyranny when there were actual slaves among us, enslaved by the very same people who screamed the loudest about taxation and representation? I was nine, but even I could see there were two wars over freedom being fought around me. One was for the independence and liberty of America. One was for the independence and liberty of all Americans. I was at the State House when they read our Declaration of Independence. The bells called me. I weaved in and out of the crowd trying to get as close as I possibly could. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was how I knew we are all equal. We deserve life, liberty, and happiness. Anthony Benizet taught Africans how to read and write because of this truth. Thomas Paine's pamphlet spread the word. The Declaration made it real. But sometimes, freedom wears a red coat. The British offered freedom to enslaved Africans who abandoned their rebel masters. So some of us found liberty that way. I can hardly judge the people who joined that cause. What else might the British give free Africans in exchange for their loyalty? Might it be better than what they would get in a newly forged nation? Who held the greater promise? Which side to choose? For me, there was no question. The declaration rang in my ears. This was my fight for independence, liberty, and the future. The world was changing. At this time, enslaved Africans were granted gradual emancipation. Maybe after this fight, we could get more rights, opportunities, maybe even citizenship. But I had to beg my mother to let me go and fight. I joined a privateer, not the Navy, mind you. This was a better chance. Join a private ship and set sail to fight for the cause. And at no small incentive, a chance at prize money. We were commissioned to capture enemy ships and keep the profits as our own. So I could risk my life for the revolution and also provide for my family. I chose 
the Royal Lewis, Captain Stephen Decatur, and joined as a powder boy at the young age of 14. My job was to transport the gunpowder from the ship's hold to the cannons on deck amid battle. All I had were the clothes on my back and hope. We were a motley crew. I wasn't the only African aboard the Royal Lewis, but I was one of few people that could read and write their name. But really, none of that mattered. Our lives were in each other's hands. Who we were alone was not as important as who we were together, a crew. And our first cruise on the Royal Lewis was a success. We captured many enemy ships from New York down to Charleston, South Carolina. Many of these ships surrendered without a single shot. And when I returned home, I was in good health with money in my pocket and the glory of victory in my heart. I turned 15 the day I watched the Continental Army march through the streets of Philadelphia on their way to Yorktown. The Rhode Island Regiment, now with two all African companies marched proudly by. As brave men as ever fought, they were determined, unstoppable. And I was too. We were doing our part to carve out our place in the new country. I was only home a few days before we were put back to sea. I was ready to capture more British ships. But we were not as untouchable as I thought. We sailed over the horizon and right into British hands. I knew that death in battle could be a possibility, but as a prisoner? For my white shipmates, I knew at best they would be exchanged for British prisoners. At worst, they would be in prison for the extent of the war. But for me, I had heard of captured African sailors being shipped to the West Indies. Slavery? Death in the cane field? I was terrified. I kept the lessons of my parents and the church close to heart. When we boarded the British ship, the Amphion, I promised myself to have been taken a prisoner for the liberties of my country and would never prove a traitor to our interest. That promise kept me alive. It guided me, sometimes even away from the easy ways out. Because the British captain offered me a new home to go with his son to England where education and new opportunities awaited. It was a good offer, as anyone in my position could only hope to achieve something more than sweeping floors or stacking crates. But I refused. I had sailed too far to abandon the cause now. And the cost of that decision was the jersey. Even the single word is horrible to me now. A ship with the mast cut off, anchored in New York Harbor. A floating prison field with men and boys younger than I. I met Daniel Bruton, a white seaman, only 13 years old. But it didn't matter whether we were black or white, free or enslaved. We were literally in this together. Short rations and either hard work cleaning the ship or unending boredom in the airless lower deck. There was sickness and death everywhere. The hull filled with prisoners held tightly together. The stench was unbearable and unforgettable. Sometimes I wonder if this is what it felt like to be held on a slave ship. Escape seemed impossible. Men who tried to swim ashore risked two miles of open water 
If they were lucky enough to get over the mud flats undetected, they still had to get to Long Island, which was under the control of the British. We schemed, of course, and once I came very close, an imprisoned officer was to be exchanged and he would take his sea chest with him. I was just small enough to fit inside, covered by his clothing. But so was Daniel Bruton, and he was two years younger and in far worse shape than me. So, I switched places to let my white brother in arms depart. I helped him in and wished him well. I thought I could wait it out and be exchanged. Months passed, and slowly my name moved up the ledger. Each month I knew I was getting closer and closer to freedom. I was on the Jersey for seven months. Finally, with the war slowing down, my name came up. That was just about two years ago to this day. So, I walked, shoeless, from Brooklyn to Trenton, where I received aid before arriving in Philadelphia. My mother barely recognized me upon my return. I am so grateful to her and Abigail for nursing me back to health. Even my hair grew back after my bout with scurvy. My ultimate reward was reuniting with a healthy Daniel Bruton. And I certainly didn't think I'd be ready to return to the sea again so soon, William. But when the wind shifts, we must trim our sails to suit. And who knows what London might hold? Our revolution has only just begun and the horizons have opened wide. I can't let my parents down. I have a good foundation and the Lord said in the gospels, to whom much is given, much is required. The problem is, is I'm not sure what I'm required to do. I know I can do more than what I've done already. I've risked my life for our nation's independence, my family, and our people. Philadelphia will be here when we get back. And who knows, but we might just learn a thing or two in London from the British after all. But come, William, enough of this talk. It's high time we put to sea and find out what kind of voyage we're in for. <laughs>